Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 152, and we're going back to the tour of the Tudor home that we started with the kitchen back in the summer. So we've also talked about the living room, and today we're moving on to the bedroom and looking at how bedrooms were used, the way the Tudors slept, and the changes that were taking place during the 16th century. But before we do all of that, I want to remind you about TudorCon. It's in just about two weeks. It's all online. So you can come from wherever in the world you are, Australia or India or Iceland, wherever you're from or anywhere in America. Obviously, it's all online. So it's three days, Friday evening, Saturday and Sunday with talks from leading tutor historians and authors. There's a tutor cook along there's period entertainment, and more. It's basically a weekend tutor extravaganza. And I'm doing my best to bring the learning, fun, and community of TutorCon live into the virtual world. The cost for the entire weekend is just $29. So you can see the speakers, learn more, and reserve your spot at englandcast.com slash TutorCon 2020. And I will hope to see you online on October 2nd. So now the Tudor bedroom. I think that most of us have probably heard the story about Shakespeare leaving his second best bed to his wife in his will, and the speculation that that has led to throughout the years as to their matrimonial bliss or not. But for me, at least, that's generally where kind of any thought about the bedroom ends. Let's go back and examine the history of the bedroom from the Middle Ages through the 16th century. As we talked about in earlier versions of these Tudor home tours, the idea of privacy was really foreign to people in medieval and Tudor England. Everyone slept communally, for example, even the monarch. Though, of course, that was largely for safety reasons. But the idea of privacy like we have today was virtually unknown. No one was ever alone. The bedroom was actually a very social and public place. It's where all of life's great events happened. It was a a very popular place. And that's kind of the opposite of how we see it today. Today, bedrooms are very private. If you went to somebody's house, you wouldn't just walk into their bedroom. Um, That would be weird. But in the Tudor period, the bedroom was the hub of a lot of things going on. So you would have all of these communal activities in your bedroom space, including courtship. But more on that in a little bit. So like I said, for the vast majority of history, people slept communally. This idea of sleeping by yourself is actually a really recent development in human history. If you were working in the manor home of the local landowner, you would sleep in the great hall along with all of the other servants. That would also help keep you all warm, of course, and it would also mean safety in numbers in case you were attacked or anything like that. So you would sleep on the rushes on the floor with the bed that you made up, literally making the bed. You would put hay in a big sack, and then you would hit the hay when you laid down. and. Pillows were considered kind of for wimps, right? Real men don't use pillows. Real men used logs. So that was how you would rest your head on a, on a nice, comfy log. No pillows. We're too soft these days with pillows. <laughs> of course, the main activity in the bedroom now is sleeping. So I think we need to chat about the sleeping habits of the Tudors, which is fascinating. Dr. Sasha Hanley at the University of Manchester has been studying the sleep patterns of medieval and early modern England, and she found some fascinating information about sleep patterns in her study that ran through 2017. So during the Tudor period, people believed that the main function of sleep was to help with digestion. 
food was heated and purified in your stomach during sleep. And so you wanted to do everything you could during sleep to help to aid that digestion. Physicians told people that they should go to sleep sleeping on their right side to start with. That was believed to be the hotter side of your body. And then you could turn to the left side after you started kind of passing out on your right side. People also tried not to eat very much right before bed because that would not help with digestion, which is still good advice to follow today. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever had late night meals or really big heavy meals and then you have a hard time sleeping after that. So the tutors were also very much with that practice of not eating right before bed. The period when you slept and at nighttime, this was a period where the natural and the supernatural worlds came together. And there was this mixing of the otherworldly and the real world. So you had to always be very wary and watchful of spirits and pixies and monsters who might come into your home while you were asleep. So you would take precautions during your bedtime rituals. You would, for example, turn your shoes upside down to prevent any spirits from putting your shoes on and walking away with them. This was a real thing. Also, if you slept in the light of the moon, you might go mad, which is where the word lunacy comes from, with luna, of course, being the word for moon. You also prepared for a good night's sleep by praying, You would ask for protection from the angels throughout the night. And you also wanted to ask for protection from nightmares. This is also, you know, all good advice for getting a good night's sleep today. Relieving yourself of stresses by having a mantra or a meditative time to just switch off the screens and relax before you went to bed. Those of you who have or had children may remember the importance of bedtime rituals for babies. Ours was bath, read, sing, feed, and then sleep. The tutors also held the importance of sleep so high in their estimation that they had a number of bedtime rituals in addition to the praying and asking for the protection of the angels. You would also prepare for sleep by drinking a tonic. You might also hang something around your face. You would hook around your ears a poultice that would have sleep-inducing ingredients like lavender or rose or chamomile or even a bit of poppy, and that would hang just underneath your nose if you hooked it behind your ears. And these ingredients were known to be cooling, which would stop your body from overheating overnight, and also quite restful, so they would help you get a good night's sleep. So, you know, you would start preparing for bed by making this poultice, by drinking your tonic, Then you would have your time of prayer and contemplation. So there was a whole ritual around bedtime that we don't have so much today. Interestingly, the idea of getting a solid eight hours of sleep each night is also a relatively recent phenomenon. The tutors slept in two distinct phases. And, you know, you might be familiar with this if you have studied religious history or, you know, the history of the Catholic Church and the services, because there were middle of the night services. And I've heard that and I kind of thought, well, that was like for the monks or or the people who were just super hardy. But most people actually slept in two phases. They would sleep once for a few hours and then they would wake up and that was their quiet time to read or to chat. There are records of people talking about how they read by the light of a full moon. They would meditate or this is also when they would have some really kind of intimate time with their spouse. The church bells would ring every hour on the hour. So they would likely kind of get used to hearing the 1 a.m. bell and they would wake up for an hour or so and then go back and have another sleep. So these were called the first and second sleeps. Interestingly, this period in between the first and the second sleeps was also considered the best time to conceive a child. So if you were having issues with fertility, you were told to conceive your child between your first and second sleep. So let's talk about beds now. Shakespeare's aforementioned second best bed would have cost about five pounds. This was about half the annual salary of a typical schoolmaster. So these beds were expensive and you wanted to show off your beds. These were a major purchase that you would make when you got married or maybe you would inherit a bed. 
um, and you would want to show it off. So sometimes people kept their beds downstairs, even in their kind of main living space, where they could be displayed to visitors or even seen through the windows. Bed sharing was very common, even among strangers. In inns, sharing the bed was common until the 19th century, and there are lots of diary entries where a traveler thinks he has the bed to himself and is going to sleep feeling all luxurious having this big bed to himself, and then he's surprised in the middle of the night by a stranger who arrived later and got into bed. So the idea of having your own bed, even between strangers, was kind of a foreign idea. Beds were expensive not just because of the wood and the skill that it took to make them, but also because of the bed curtains. The bed curtains would offer the only privacy that you would get in your bedroom. You would have heavy curtains for winter, keeping it cozy and warm in your little area. Sometimes I think about how cozy that must have been, being all cocooned in this little space in between the bed curtains. And then you would change them out for lighter ones in the summer. But bed curtains were also a huge fire hazard, especially in these rooms that had rushes on the ground and thatch in the roof. So as people began to value privacy more and as better heating with chimneys became affordable, the bed curtains began to fade away. Bedrooms were shared by servants and children, and they would have slept on a trundle or a truckle bed underneath the main bed. It would pull out. There's a story from the 17th century historian Thomas Aubrey about when William Roper came to see Thomas More, proposing that he marry one of More's daughters, but he didn't actually care which one. So Thomas walks him upstairs. Both of the daughters are sleeping in the truckle bed next to the parental bed, and he pulls the blankets off of them both so William could, you know, appraise them. So the meat market aspect of this story aside, It's interesting to note that two teenage girls of marriageable age are sharing a truckle bed sleeping right next to their parents. Today, that would be weird. But in the 16th century, and even in the 17th century, when Thomas Aubrey was writing this, not weird at all. Totally normal. If you were really well off, you would have your rope bed. You'd pull the ropes tight each night, which is where the saying sleep tight comes from. And that would be covered with a straw mattress. Then on top of that, you would put your sack of feathers. To keep out the bed bugs, don't let the bed bugs bite, you would sprinkle wormwood on your mattress. Then you you would keep it nice and cozy by having the early version of a hot water bottle. You would heat up a rock or a brick, something like that, in the fire, and then wrap it up in a cloth to warm up the bed before you got in. Sounds really cozy too, doesn't it? The Elizabethan traveler William Harrison wrote about the beds of the medieval period. He was writing, you know, a hundred years later, and he was hinting at the idea that modern people had become quite soft. He wrote, straw pellets covered only with a sheet under coverlets and a good round log under their heads instead of a bolster or pillow. If it were so that our fathers or the good man of the house had within seven years after his marriage purchased a mattress and thereto a sack of chafe to rest his head upon, he thought himself to be as well lodged as the lord of any town. So, you know, if you had a log under your head, that was considered the height of luxury. Um, And people in the Elizabethan period were becoming so soft and so wimpy that they needed to have feathers. Ugh! An example of the kind of beds that would be common in 1582, there was an inventory made of Thomas Offley. He was a gentleman, and in his inventory, his bedroom listed a plain bedstead with a wool mattress, feather bed and bolster, white and red blankets, and a green coverlet embroidered with letters and flowers canopy and curtains of yellow and blue dyed canvas, as well as a truckle bed for his servant. So that's the kind of bed that a wealthy gentleman would have. Bedrooms were also, of course, where your marriage was consummated and even where you may have courted. It became popular by the 17th century, but even earlier couples who were interested in getting married might participate in bundling. Bundling was where a girl was wrapped up in a sack and put into a bed, and the guy was put into the bed with her. 
and a board was put right down the middle between them to keep any hanky-panky from happening. It gave the couple the chance to talk and sort of be intimate in a way without being fully tempted. After you got married, the bedroom was part of the wedding ceremony. After the wedding reception, before bed, the bridesmaids would bring the bride into the bedroom and undress her, and then the bridegroom would come in with all of his friends. They would undress him. There was much drinking and merriment and lots of good times to be had in the bedroom, and then they would put them into bed together. In medieval England, in the morning, you might display a bloody sheet to show that the marriage was consummated and the girl was a virgin. So, you know, privacy, eh, not so much. It should be noted that officially, marital relations were for marriage only. And beds were kind of iffy because they were this constant reminder of the thorniness of the bedroom activities. There were a lot of rules around that. So you were forbidden from having carnal knowledge on feast days, Sundays, Lent, and other holy days. It's actually a wonder that any children were born at all. And as for enjoying the act, (laughs) no way. Forget that, especially for a woman. One argument against educating women, for example, was that it might titillate them a bit too much and lead them to desire, well, men. You were meant to lie back and think of England and have that be it. Yes, I know that saying came from the Victorian age, so don't email me and tell me that. (laughs) Women were told to avoid any kind of arousal. They were told to get lots of fresh air and avoid anything stimulating like reading and not really ever do much thinking. It must be noted also that syphilis had developed by 1495 when some Italians had developed strange pustules on their skin. By 1503, it was in England and it was known as the French pox. It spread throughout the 16th century and became a warning against engaging in any sort of extramarital activities. The bedroom is also, of course, where life began. It's where a woman gave birth. Experienced women would gather in the bedroom with the mother. I did do an episode on pregnancy and childbirth in medieval and Tudor England, so I won't go into all of that detail here, but you can check it out if you're interested. I'll put the link in the show notes at englandcast.com slash bedroom. It's interesting to note that the bedroom is where the most important life events happened. You were born in a bedroom. You were married in a bedroom. You gave birth in a bedroom. And you died in your bedroom. Dying was a much more public event than it is today. There were so very many interesting ways to die in the pre-modern era. You could die of the itch, or freezing, or sore throat, worms, the French pox. Nearly 40% of accidental deaths were from drowning or mortification, whatever that is. And listed as a leading cause of death in the mortality rules was teeth, which may refer to when your teeth fall out because of scurvy. I'm not sure. Looking at the death rolls from pre modern England, you see all kinds of causes of death like fright, drinking cold water, or stagnation of the fluids. And of course, for women, there was childbirth. About one in five women died in childbirth. Nearly a quarter of all marriages were remarriages because one spouse had died. And so death was public. Mourning was an important part of life, much more so than today. In the 19th and 20th century, we began to move to hospitals for many of these life events, move them outside of our home. And so the bedroom may have become more private since these previously public rituals no longer happened there. By the 19th century, privacy was becoming more important, and even the middle classes expected to have privacy. Homes suddenly had hallways with bedrooms off to the side with closing doors. And so the importance of beds and the ritual of the beds began to disappear. As the scientific revolution moved us into a world that is explainable through science, the rituals to fend off spirits and otherworldly visitors have disappeared as well. So, you know, maybe bringing back some of the ritual might help us all get a better night's sleep. So I'm thinking about bringing some Tudor ritual to my nighttime routine and having a tonic and having those kind of couple 
quiet moments of prayer and reflection. So what about you? If you decide to try to sleep like a tutor, let me know how it goes. <laughs> and let me know what it does for your, for your night of sleep. Also, if you decide to sleep in shifts, I would be fascinated to hear how that goes. So that's it for this week. You can get show notes with sources at englandcast.com slash bedroom. And do let me know what you thought about this episode. You can get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016 Tesco. Or you can also join the free tutor learning circle at tutorlearningcircle.com. That's where I'm hanging out now instead of social media because I have a long story about so or I have a long theory and opinions, lots of opinions about social media. So I'm hanging out at tutorlearningcircle.com, posting links, and you can get in touch with me there as well. It's free to join. It's a super cool place. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to get your TutorCon tickets for October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th so we can see you online having an awesome time at TutorCon. All right. Thanks so much for listening, you guys, and I will talk with you again soon.